On behalf of the Midway congregation, let me welcome our guest with us. Uh, we appreciate you coming to visit with us. And, and uh, if you would, please look on the back of the seat there. There's a guest card. If you would, fill one out at this time and, and place it on the, in the collection basket outside, or you can place it on that table in the foyer as you exit the building. We appreciate you coming to visit with us. Also, if you would, please turn your electronic devices off now uh, so our worship will not be interrupted uh, as we begin our worship. Our opening prayer this morning will be led by Randy Wood. Our singing by Grant Addison. Our lesson today will be by Kelly Sims. Ben Lawler will head the Lord's table. And at the close, Mike Morton will lead our dismissal prayer. At this time, we're going to enter our worship service. Shall we pray together? Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this beautiful Lord's day. Father, for every blessing of life that is granted unto us. Father, most of all, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who suffered, bled, and died on the cross, whereby we may have the hope of eternal life. If we've obeyed the gospel and been found faithful. Father, we're so thankful for the privilege that we have, the freedom that we have to come out and worship Thee this morning without fear. We pray, Father, this privilege will always be ours to have. We pray for those that have fought in, for that freedom and for those that continue to, tie, to fight in the freedom that we enjoy. Father, we're mindful for those that are sick, those that are hurting, those in shut-ins and those at home. Father, we pray for Sharon Posey and Doug Grace. Marlene Hyde, and James Snow, Julie Sievert, and all of those that are suffering. Father, we are mindful of those with lost loved ones. We're mindful this morning of the Myers family and the passing of Neil. Be with each one of those, Father, during this time. We're thankful for Brother Mark and the lessons that he presents to his be with us today as we he, as as he present, presents lessons in our Bible hour, and we pray for Brother Sims as in our worship hour that he we will take what is presented to us to our life and apply it. Father, we we pray that you'll forgive us where we fail thee. We know that we often come short of your glory. Father, we pray for the church, the wide world over. May it grow in spirit and in number also. We pray for those in foreign fields, missionary fields. We pray for the work in Romania uh, during this difficult time in our world. Help us, Father, to always put you first in our life. We ask this prayer in Christ's precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our two songs this morning. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered
I have a confession to make this morning. And it's a confession. I did not tell the elders this before I got the job. I did not want them to, to know this before they, they hired me. Um, but I have a confession to make this morning. I am a diehard professional wrestling fan. Um, and that is, that is a lot more embarrassing now than it used to be. So I just wanted to get that out of the way this morning. I have been to two WrestleManias. I have been to several Monday Night Rawls and Friday Night Smackdowns. I even talked Megan into going with me to a WWE NXT show, which is basically the minor leagues for the WWE. And I thought we were having a great time. You know, a lot of exciting things were happening. And then one big moment in the night happened, and I look over at Megan, and she was fast asleep in her chair in the BJCC. So I guess it's fair to say that we don't share the same passion for the sport. I even wanted to be a wrestler at one point in my life. All right, I had a character picked out. I was going to be the rage monster K.O. Sims. And the way this character worked is I'll be a mild-mannered guy, and then when something set me off, man, I would lose it. Okay? That was my character. I had everything picked out, but then I, I finally decided against that route in my life. And I know you don't hear that very often. It came down to two choices, youth minister or pro wrestler. Hopefully I, hopefully I cho- made the right choice. I guess if you see me body slamming your children at some point, then we'll know that I made the wrong decision. But my favorite wrestler of all time is The Rock. Okay, I, he was my hero when I was a kid. Every time The Rock came on the television screen, I lost it. Okay, I loved The Rock. And The Rock was known as a man of a thousand catchphrases. He had so many catchphrases. He said, if you smell what The Rock is cooking, he said, finally, The Rock has come back. But my favorite is when he would be in the ring with another guy, and he'd be standing across the ring from another guy, and he would ask him a simple question. He would say, is that what you think? Is that really what you think? The other guy would take the microphone and he would slowly, for dramatic effect, bring it up to his mouth. And right as he began to speak, the rock would blurt, it, blurt out, cut him off and say, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you think. Well, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, respectfully, with as much respect as I could possibly utter this phrase, it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you think. In fact, it doesn't even matter what I think. You know, surely God is okay if we just say that Jesus Christ is our Savior. Surely that's okay. I mean, I I wouldn't think that God would punish somebody just because they didn't get in some water to be saved. It doesn't matter what you think. Surely it's okay if we wheel some instruments in here. You know, that would be a lot more fun. We'd be able to get a younger audience. I really think God will be okay with us having a better time in here. It doesn't matter what you think. You know, I, I can do... Surely God is okay... As long as I come here on Sunday morning and I sing songs to him and listen to his sermon, surely he's perfectly okay with me going out into the world and living however I want to live. I really think God will be okay with that. It doesn't matter what you think. The only thing that matters, the only thing that matters is what God said. Period. End of sentence. That's it. This morning we're going to take a look at three stories. One of them, we're going to talk about a guy who thought that his opinion mattered more than God's. That he knew better than God. Thankfully, he came to his senses. In the next story, we'll read of a group of people that trusted God's judgment completely. And they were rewarded for that. And finally, we're going to learn about a guy that had a very human thought. A thought that I believe every person in this room would have had in that situation. But it cost him his life because it went against what God said. Are you familiar with the story of Naaman? This story is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. If you want to turn over there with me. 2 Kings chapter 5. Verse 1. This is what the Bible says. It says, Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor. Because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria, 
He was a mighty man of valor. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. He was a mighty man of valor. What does that mean? Well, to translate that in today's words, he was a bad man. Naaman was a bad man. He was commander of the army, a mighty man of valor. But what was he known for now? All he was known for was being a leper. How badly do you think he wanted to get rid of this dreaded disease? He was a bad man. Everybody feared him. Commander of the army. What could he not do? But what was he known for now? All he was known for was having a disgusting disease. How badly do you think he wanted to get rid of it? Surely Naaman was ready and willing to do whatever it took to get rid of this disease. Surely. Let's look in verse 2. Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel, and the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothes. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you Naaman my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he is seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel." So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. At this moment, what do you think is going through Naaman's mind? He's right outside of the house of Elisha, the man who he knows can cure him of this disgusting disease. Surely he's thinking, I'm going to be clean. I'm going to be clean. Surely he's ready and willing to do whatever it takes, whatever Elisha says, to be clean. Surely. You would think, right? Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. You know what Naaman is saying in this passage? You know what he's saying? He's saying, God, I know better than you. Why the Jordan River? These other rivers are so much better. The Abana, the Farpar, the Jordan River is nasty. And God, I thought this would be so much easier. Why can't Elisha come out here? He would wave his hand over my, over my disease and I'd be healed. That'd be so much easier, God. This doesn't make any sense. You just don't understand. Does that sound like us? God, you don't understand how tired I am on Sunday mornings. I can't be here all the time. You don't understand, God. God, you don't understand how attractive that girl is. You don't get it. You don't understand. If you were in my shoes, you would understand, God. Name is thinking, surely God will be okay with me washing in another river. These other rivers are so much better. Surely He's okay with that. Naaman? Naaman? It doesn't matter what you think. If you don't do exactly what God said, you're going to have leprosy. If we don't do exactly to a T what God asks of us, guess what? We're not going to receive our reward. Verse 13. But his sermons came his sermons. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash 
and be clean? Naaman's servants say to Naaman, what are you doing? Look at this opportunity that you've been given. It's exactly what you wanted. It's exactly what you needed. You can be clean. All you have to do is follow these simple, simple, simple instructions from Elisha. That should sound familiar to us too. All we have to do is follow his simple, simple, simple instructions. Why do we question his judgment? Why do we think that we know better than him? All we have to do is follow what he said. That's all we're asked to do. Now let me take a moment to say this. Thank God for friends that tell you like it is. Right? You got some friends that will do that for you? Naaman did, thankfully. You got friends that will light you up when you need it, when you need to be shaken a little bit? What a difficult position that is to put our friends in. I've been there. Because you know what you want to say, but you're scared how they will react. You don't want to lose them as friends. Thank God for friends that care enough about us to tell us when we're wrong. Finally, in verse 14, So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. If Elisha dipped in the Abana or the Farpar, would he have been clean? If he dipped one time, maybe two times, would he have been clean? How about six times? I mean, the sixth time, he's so close. I mean, six is right in front of seven. Surely, surely he had been clean after six times. No. Only when he came up the seventh time, only when he followed what God said exactly to a T, was he clean. Folks, it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what God said. Because I said so, how many of you have heard this statement from your parents? at one point in your life. Your parents tell you to do something. You say, why? Why? And what is is their answer? They 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 don't go on explaining why. They just say this simple phrase. Because I said so. What does this phrase mean? This phrase means, trust me. Trust me, I have more experience than you. I know better than you. Because I said so. And to be honest with you, I really wish that I had have listened to this phrase when my parents used it on me when I was a kid. My dad had a big thing about playing tackle football. He didn't want us to play tackle football without pads. So uh, one day I was out with my friends, and of course I wanted to get in there and, and play because the rest of them were playing. And I'm going to be honest with you people, I was a monster that day. Nobody could tackle me. All right? I, was, I was by far the MVP of that day. And I remember catching the pass on the side of the curb and the first guy couldn't bring me down. The second guy couldn't bring me down. But the third and fourth guys, they teamed up and they got me. And as I was going to the ground, I held the football like this so I had nothing to protect my skull, which landed right on the asphalt of the street beside the yard we were playing. And as I was walking home with blood pouring down the left side of my head, looking like a gunshot victim, I really wish... I would have listened to my dad when he said, because I said so. How many times do we do that to God? Why, God? Why can't I do what I want to do? Why do I have to do this? Why can't I do this thing that I want to do? Because he said so. Our next story is found in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua 6. And we'll start in verse 1 there. Our next story here, we see the same thing from God. When He gives us instructions, it doesn't matter if they seem silly. It doesn't matter if we don't understand. It doesn't matter if we would do it differently. All that matters is that He knows what is best and we follow His instructions. Why? Because He said so. Verse 1. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. That should have been it right there. 
He said, I have given Jericho into your hand. God made the promise to them. Jericho, I have delivered it into your hands. All you have to do is follow what I say. God has promised us. He's promised us a great reward. So anything that follows that promise, anything that follows that promise, we should be ready and willing to do. Verse 3, You shall march around the city, all the men of war going around the city once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. On the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every one straight, before him. What? Excuse me? That does not seem like sound military strategy to me. Does that seem like sound military strategy to you? doesn't make a lick of sense. Walk around the city. I mean, we're going to look like a bunch of goobs out there walking around the city like that. And then on the seventh day, walk around seven times. Are we not going to be too tired to charge into the city? That seems silly, God. It doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what He said. We find out in the next few verses that they do what they're supposed to do. For the first six days, they do exactly what they're supposed to do. They've done good so far. But I've I got to wonder, after the sixth day, after they've walked around the city one time each day, you got to think, some of them were dreading that seventh day. Like, my goodness. Now we've got to walk around the city seven times in one day? you got to think some of them are questioning it at this point. They've got to be thinking, we've done enough. We've done good enough. Good enough. You know what Jimbo Fisher, the head football coach for Texas A&M, said about good enough? He said, when good enough gets good enough, that's when we got problems. When good enough is acceptable to us, we got problems. Because my friends, with God, I promise you, good enough is never good enough. Verse 15, let's uh, move down to verse 15. <clears throat> On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city, and the city and all that is within it shall be devoured to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them... You take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the wall fell down flat. My friends... When God makes a promise, God comes through every single time. There's not one time throughout the course of human history that when God makes a promise, He does not come through. God made the promise in verse 2. He said, I've given Jericho into your hand. All you have to do is follow my instruction. And then we just read, and the wall fell down flat. What an example for us. They might have thought it was silly. Maybe some of them questioned God's judgment. But they never let what they thought get in the way of what He said. What an example for us today in 2021. This is where things get real for us. This story. Our last story of the night, of the morning. We learned a lot from the first two stories. We realize, though, in this story, this story of Uzzah, we realize the consequences of placing our thoughts, our opinions, ahead of God's. Do we have a healthy fear of God? Do we really fear God? 
Look, God is a loving God. I know that. I know He's a forgiving God. He is a merciful God. But make no mistake about it. God is a jealous God. He doesn't want obedience. He doesn't need obedience. He demands, demands obedience. Today we're in an age of what I call feel-good Christianity where a lot of people are convinced that they can come to church some. They post a Bible verse on social media. Maybe they get a tattoo that says something about God or Jesus on it. They wear a, a necklace with a cross on it. Maybe some earrings with a cross on it. But as long as you do some of those things, you can do whatever you want. God loves you. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to do whatever you want to do. Let's look at 2 Samuel 6, 3-8. through 8, And see how that flies according to uh, when it's put up against the Bible. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahiho, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahiho went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were making merry before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. Man, everything is good right now. They're having a good old time. In verse 6, And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah and God struck him down there because of his error and he died there beside the ark of God. It doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what God says. That seems harsh, doesn't it, to us? Does that not seem a little harsh? I mean, as I was just trying to help, surely, surely God doesn't want the ark to break. Surely He doesn't want this holy thing to touch the ground. What did God say? Do not touch the ark. I got a speeding ticket a couple months ago, and I was going 36 miles per hour in 25 mile per hour zone. Okay? And here's what the cop told me. He said, I usually only give tickets if you're going above 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. So if you do the simple math there, that means he gave me a ticket because of one mile per hour. One mile per hour. And of course, at first, that upset me. But in reality, I have no, no legs to stand on. Because what does the law say? The law said, in that zone, you do not go over 25 miles per hour. What did I do? I was going 36. What did God say? Do not touch the ark. You think God doesn't care how you live? You think He doesn't care if you embarrass Him? You think He doesn't care if you disobey Him? Is that really what you think? God struck him down there because of his error. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what celebrities think. It doesn't matter what religious leaders think. It doesn't matter what your friends think. It doesn't matter what your friends think. It's okay. What did God say? That's the only question we should be asking. I think the biggest mistake that Christians have made over the last several years is that they almost have turned God into a hippie. They think that God is a hippie. You know, He's like, I love you guys, man. I want you all to live. Do whatever you want to do. Peace, love. No, no consequences. No rules. It's your life. Live how you want to live. If you don't think that God demands obedience, then you are reading a different Bible than the one I've been reading my entire life. God demands obedience. Obedience. I know this may be stunning information to the people in the audience this morning, but uh, I am a fast food connoisseur, so I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit obsessed with, with fast food. I, uh, I've eaten so much fast food that one of my kidneys is actually a Big Mac, so uh, I've, I've partaken a lot in fast food. But if you notice, all fast food places have a slogan. You know, you got McDonald's, I'm loving it. You got Subway, eat fresh. 
And who could possibly forget Taco Bell's famous slogan, Taco Bell, you have five minutes to get to the bathroom. Who could, who could forget that slogan? But the one I want to focus on this morning is Burger King. Have it your way. What does this slogan mean? It means when you come here, when you come to Burger King, you're the king of the castle. You want your burger plain? You want pickles? You want mayonnaise? You want lettuce? However you want it, you got it. We live in a have it your way world, don't we? Do what you want. No consequences, no rules. But I got news for you, Christian. If you want to get your reward, you can't have it your way. I'm sorry. There's a way that we are supposed to live. And at the end of the day, you can't have it your way. It doesn't really matter what you think, what I think. God's Word is all that really matters. But the good news is, the choice is simple. There's only two choices. The world acts like you have so many choices and there's so many options to live your life. But in reality, we know that there are only two choices. You're either with Him or you're against Him. So the question this morning is which one is it going to be? On one end, on one end, you can have it your way. You really can. Your opinion is all that matters. You can live however you want. You can do whatever you want. But at the end of the day, I'm telling you, it's a miserable life. And all it will do is lead to an eternity of misery. But if you choose Him, no, you can't have it your way. If you choose God, you cannot have it your way. And the truth is, your thoughts and opinions do not matter compared to His. But what a feeling it is to be in His care, to be in His family, to be in His hands. There's nothing like it. And the reward is an eternity of unmatched joy. I think it's worth following what He asks, don't you? This morning, I hope, I hope you've already made that decision to be on His side, to follow what He says, to put aside your thoughts and opinions and follow what He said. But if you haven't, we're here for you this morning. Whatever your need is, we're here. That's what the church is for. That's why God created the church in the first place, so we could help each other, encourage each other, make sure we all get to heaven. So whatever your need is this morning, we're here for you. Please come as we stand and as we sing. Just as I for the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll be reading from the book of Hebrews, the second chapter. Now, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. 
You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now I'm putting everything in subjection to him. He left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for a little while was made lower than the angels. Namely, Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Our most righteous Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for your Son. Father, we're thankful that you had a plan for our salvation. Father, we're thankful that Christ was willing to come to this earth. We're thankful that he was willing to live as a man and to die as a man. Father, we're so thankful that we have this emblem which represents his body. We pray that we'll partake of it in a manner which will be pleased in your sight. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's give thanks for the cup. Father, we're mindful that this cup represents Christ's blood. We're humble that he was willing to be hung upon a tree, be crucified for our sins. If we partake of it, we pray we'll do so in a humble mind and a thankful spirit. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. As a matter of convenience, we'll give thanks for the contribution. Father, we're so thankful that you have allowed us to go out and make gain this week. Father, we pray that we'll give back to you which is rightfully thine. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Kelly, thank you for a good lesson. Glenda Terry is in critical condition. Uh, she is the niece of Bluedell Blanton. Uh, please pray for her. Uh, also, Marlene Hyde, she uh, was at the emergency room on Friday, and she has gone home. And Miss Marlene is, is uh, trying to recover from her surgeries. On Sunday, September the 5th, worship will begin at 9.30 till 10.30. The Bible classes will be from 1040 until 1130. Sunday night will be virtual as we're doing it right now. And then on Wednesday night, Bible study will be the same at 630 here at the building. Also on September the 5th, Eddie Bull's class, which meets at the end of the hall down here, Eddie Bull's class will begin their classes down there in the classroom. And also, Mike Wolf will be back in the auditorium doing the auditorium class. And Mark Howell's class in the basement will be meet in the basement uh, on September the 5th down in the old fellowship hall. So Eddie, Mark, and Mike's classes will resume on September the 5th. On Wednesday night this week, we'll be meeting at 6.30, of course, and Kirk Brothers uh, from Heritage Christian University will be speaking on the topic of God is holy. God is holy. <clears throat> Don't forget tonight is Family Devo, Devo at 6 o'clock at Kelly and Megan and Miller's house. And uh, 
Boys, y'all are to bring drinks. Girls, bring desserts. And come and have a good time of devotion at at uh, Kelly and Megan house this afternoon at 6 o'clock. We'll have a closing song and then Mike Morton will dismiss us. Father, we're so thankful to have been able to come today and worship you. Thank you, Father, as we approach your throne of glory, that we've been in your presence worshiping you today. We pray, Father, that we've worshiped, and our worship today has been according to your will, except in your sight. Father, we're thankful for our church, for our elders, and our deacons. Be with them, Father, and strengthen them, and be with Mark. Father, bless him, and let him have a long life in your service. Father, we pray for those who are sick that's had such a difficult time. We're proud that Amber's better and continue to be better. And Father, be with her every day and strengthen her and her family. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us. In the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.